and welcome. Um, I hope you can hear me. I don't know if uh, the mic is working. I think so. So um, we're here today to, um, if this is the right place, I would guess, New York, um, how to go from a local um, leader to a global player. And we have a lot of um, local leaders and global players just around me. And so we're going to start it off uh, with John, John Moore, uh, Acorn Energy. And John, what is your company doing, more or less, in two words, two sentences? So Acorn Energy is an energy technology company. It's located on, it's listed on the NASDAQ. And we have four companies, uh, one in Israel and, uh, and three in, uh, well, one in Georgia and two in California, which is sort of like an international location. Great, and we have another John, uh, John Chagarian. Um, it's um, Electronic Recyclers International, and international, that's the key word here. Would you explain a little bit um, what um, your company is doing? We're the world's largest privately held electronic waste recycling company. So we take your old electronics and we recycle it both in an environmentally friendly way and responsible way, but we also make sure all your data goes away. And data has become one of the biggest issues for every government, every corporation, and every person that has a cell phone, television, copy or machine, or anything with a hard drive. Or some breath and a heartbeat. Um, so Doug, uh, Doug Jameson, you're uh, last but not least, um, Harrison, Harrison Group. Um, so what are you guys doing? So uh, Harrison Harris Group is a publicly traded venture capital firm. Uh, we're based here in the city. Uh, we make early stage investments in uh, companies really at the intersection of uh, biology and other uh, disciplines, um, IT, physics, math, engineering, uh, and we build those companies. Uh, most of them start in the U.S., but as they expand, they expand uh, certainly overseas as well. Mm -hmm. So, um, well, my, my first question would be for you, John, uh, in the, in the um, energy business, um, how would you, I mean, Energy is very capital intensive, and um, and it's been um, building up quite some steam here um, with the fracking in the U.S. Um, how would you define being a global player in, in that in that type of environment? So we we uh, what's interesting is the U.S. has has innovated a lot in energy, and it's not so much in the technology side as it's in the markets and the regulation. So we created a company called Converge, which we took public through Citigroup and, and did a secondary through Goldman Sachs. And we created this whole new way of, of managing energy called demand response. You know, Normally, what you do in the electric grid is you create energy, you create the electricity, you can't store it. Um, so the challenge is, you know, what do you do during periods of peak demand? Because peak demand can be two to three times the uh, normal demand, and eight times as high sometimes. So what we did was, First of all, we had to help create the regulatory market. So there's something called PGM, which is the world's largest power market here in the US. And they created a way of paying for our service, which was called demand response. And uh, then what that did was, by creating that market, we were then sort of brought into international markets like South Africa, um, where what they wanted to know is, well, first of all, how do we create these demand response markets? And second of all, uh, where you provide the service for us. So that's, that's by innovation, what you do is you create the suction by solving major problems uh, that this sort of pulls you overseas. So uh, I think Doug mentioned something when we, um, when we chatted outside a little bit, that it's rather than being a conscious decision, everybody sitting around in a conference room and then deciding that they would go from local to global, um, it's it's more kind of like you said, it's a pull to go to go global international. This is what you described with your uh, companies. Yeah, so so we're a little different in that we invest at the very early stages in technology companies, and um, many of those companies, uh, as they mature, they end up uh, producing a intermediate. Um, or a component, an electronic or semiconductor um, uh, company. And so what we see oftentimes is we see a company that starts in the U.S., does its technology development in the U.S., but as it actually gets um, moving into the mainstream, it needs to locate near partners. So, so a good example is a company uh, we invested in, in fairly recently and grew pretty quickly, but it's called HZO, based in Salt Lake City, Utah. And what it does is it coats 
electronics to make them waterproof. And it's a barrier coating. It's not a hydrophobic coating that water moves off of or, or drips move off of. It's actually a barrier. You can run, um, you know, on, on site they have a 40 inch LCD television running underwater for 30 days. Right, um, so this is total barrier-proof electronics, and what happens is, is as you're making that, so you do all the work at home, you figure out how to do the coating, uh, you have the equipment in-house, but when you actually go to manufacture, right, they're not going to manufacture telephones, LCD tablets. They're going to be a uh, a component or a process in the middle of a manufacturing stream, and so to do that, you have to go close to where the manufacturing. So in the early days, groups were actually shipping us. They they'd OEM part of a product, motherboard, they'd ship it to Salt Lake City, Utah, and you'd ship it back. Imagine how inefficient that is in today's world. So you need to set up on location as part of the commons of where you're manufacturing. So we see a lot of companies then move closer to where the manufacturing is done, many times in Asian countries. But also, in, in this case, um, Deutsche Telekom. Across Europe, making a tablet for Deutsche Telekom, you need to be where they're manufacturing. So they now have five or six different uh, locations, manufacturing, and they set up business development in those locations as well so that they're part of a larger process. So we see that oftentimes semiconductors, electronics, but we also start to see it more and more on um, active pharmaceutical ingredients in those type of companies as well. So we see um, clients are pulling you in John's case, and um, Doug is reporting that um, it's the manufacturing, the production actually. Um, leading to more international presence. John, um, you're uh, in a different space somewhat. Um, you're um, a recycling company, a green company. Um, recycling and waste management, basically, I always thought of a very local business. How come that um, you're, you're going international? Well, you're going international because A, the OEMs, many of the OEMs that we service are internationally based. Mm -hmm. And when you think about the largest electronic manufacturing companies, there's Samsung and LG. Then you go down to all the Japanese OEMs. Um, so there's very few US OEMs that really... Not anymore. Not anymore. <laughs> so a lot of the stuff is invented here, but as Doug was saying, is produced uh, abroad. And then also where a lot of our commodities go is abroad for, back, for repurposing. Mm -hmm. So we take in 25 to 30 million pounds of electronics every month, and if we commoditize that, all those commodities have to go somewhere. Typically, it's international. It's not for domestic repurposing. But the great story is that nothing goes to a landfill, and we do it all domestically here locally. So where the electronics are used are local. Where the, where the resources are then sent for repurposing is international. Mm -hmm. So um, I, uh, I looked into, before um, preparing this panel, um, I looked into um, this whole discussion about um, going global, being a global player, and um, there is a McKinsey uh, study that about 30% of American companies are not really um, using uh, the potential they have internationally. Um, is that something that um, is, is surprising to you, or is that something that you would say, yeah, well, um, that, that sounds about right. This is something that um, people need to have another look at. John, maybe we... With you. I was lucky to go to Switzerland, uh, high school in Switzerland, and uh, I, I went over there, and uh, I was shocked that there was a different perspective than the American perspective. You know, I was, I was like, I can't believe this, right? And, uh, and it was incredible because people spoke so many different languages, and they were so open to the world. And I was, I thought Wilmington, Delaware, was the center of the universe, and I was, I was sadly mistaken. It, it, so, it isn't. Uh, no, it, it is. Oh. It, yeah, I want to tell. I'm going to record and say the vice president will not be happy about this. <laughs> <laughs> that's right, that's right, if you go to start church, but uh, a great example of how to do a lot with very little. But so what, <laughs> what, what I learned at, at, uh, at, at, uh, at being international was that um, it's very important to, um, you know, like if, you're, if you, people come to New York to do business, to do business in the U.S., people go to London to do business, to do business internationally. Mm -hmm. So our big market is almost a disadvantage in some ways because it's so big and it's so homogenous. Um, and, and Europe is a great place to uh, develop new products, but the markets are so still fragmented that you ha you're almost forced to, to ship them overseas. My father was a scientist with DuPont, and he developed 
a, a stain resistant carpet fiber. He found that German housewives, you know, my, my, my dad's boss told him, you know, build, we want every carpet fiber plant in Europe to run the same fibers that we run in the US. Well, he got over to Europe and he said, look, that's you know, two weeks. That was the worst <laughs> idea he'd ever heard. And he found that German housewives loved white carpets and they loved red wine, but they hated it when the red wine ended up on the white carpets. Well, right. you know, I would subscribe to that. <laughs> <laughs> so what he did was he and his team developed something called Stain Master and uh, developed it in Europe. It was before the EU. Uh, the markets were very small. They brought it back to the U.S., called it Stain Master, and now it's a $3 billion a year business. So it's, it's a good example of how, you know, things like Starbucks have to sort of get their germination in places like Europe come back here, get scaled up, and then you know there's a huge stake if you can have the discipline to expand overseas. It's a, it's a big opportunity, but you know you sort of have to use each country's strengths as their strengths, and, and uh, you know each side has positive and to you know to, to, to get yourself into the the German Chamber of Commerce in that town. <laughs> well, you, you know, what I, what I was thinking while, while listening to you, what, what is really interesting is that I think the Germans are actually um, not as good as Americans in terms of networking. I, I think they're, they, they're very purposeful, and I, I say that as a German, so they usually go someplace and they present their business card and they state their case. And, and they rely on their product and the quality of the product. and. That's all there is to say. Americans are much more kind of trying to figure out who would I approach if I would like to do this, or who would have um, a contact for me. And they're very good at networking. Networking comes natural to most Americans, um, as does small talk. Whereas Germans, there are some Germans that are very good at small talk, but a lot of Germans have a hard time um, usually, I mean, I have my cards here, my little cards, so that I know what to talk about. Um, so would you say that cultural factors, John, um, you kept nodding away, um, would you say cultural factors um, often thought of as more the soft part of, of business, are they really the, the part that you have to nail to be successful? Yes, and I'll give an, a, an example. We created col uh, constructive collaborations to continue to grow our brand. So instead of just taking private equity money or other types of money that's available to a company like ours as we're scaling, we created opportunities for strategic partnerships. So for instance, on the uh, constructively on the backside, we wanted to collapse our downstream. So we had the most transparent collapse downstream when it came to um, selling off our commodities. So we partnered up with a company called LS Nico Copper. Mm -hmm. LS Nico Copper is the second largest copper smelter in the world out of South Korea, owned by the Koo family. The Koo family are the founders of LG Electronics. Well, to make their investment, they sent over three sets of lawyers during a nine month period, three sets of accountants, and then in the final end of it, I had to camp out in South Korea for 30 days and have four sets of meetings every day until they made sure that I fit and understood their culture. And people come up to me and say, oh, you're so lucky. So lucky, <laughs> 30 days camped out in a hotel room having four sets of meetings over and over meeting hundreds of their employees and making sure that they kicked the tires, looked under the hood and everything else, you know, it, it's all about the, embracing the culture, as John earlier said, and, and, and really feeling part of it and may, not going over with the, we are the best in America. No, you go in hat in hand and you say, how can we, what are our, how do we serve? How do we serve? M much better said. And what are our common bonds instead of what are our differences? And what, and it's been one of the greatest partnerships. And they take all our copper and all our um, precious metals and we have, a huge partner backing us if we need more money, if we need relationships around the world. And the same goes for my um, uh, German counterpart at Alcoa, Klaus Kleinfeld. He met me at one of his smelters and invited me to New York. And he said, listen, this is a great opportunity. Alcoa created the take back model in terms of how to take back cans and recycle aluminum. And we can help you grow. 
And I said, how? He says, how much money do you need? We need your aluminum to recycle your aluminum. How much money do you need and how much know-how? And then they, they invested another constructive collaboration. So now a guy like me sitting in my office in New York or California who wouldn't have any idea what the social political landscape looks like in 40 different countries around the world can call a high-level Alcoa executive at any time and say, what's it like in Mexico? What's it like in Brazil? What's it like in China? From the ground up, because they're there. They've done it for 126 years. That kind of experience, that kind of know-how is, is, is worth far more than money. And you can't buy that. You have to create relationships with people and with organizations that are very constructive and are very open to all the possibilities, way outside of wherever you're sitting in the United States. So the other thing I would say is that where the Germans, you said that they're not good at small talk, but it, I, I once, I was once bragging to somebody about a success I had. I said, yeah, it's, it's good to be at the right place at the right time. And he said, yeah, or any place a long time. And that's what the Germans are great at. The Germans are great at persistence, right? And, and, and they tend to have a much longer term perspective. Like an American will typically be in a business for, I don't know, five years or something like that, where a German will spend his entire career becoming an expert on something. And therefore, you know, being anywhere a long time, you tend to get lucky. I think you also see, uh, so it's, it's funny, uh, I have a story from one of our more recent portfolio companies, um, but you find it humorous. So started by a, a German researcher, um, she studies mucus, right, oh. so snot. And uh, <laughs> she studies the, these, these peptides in mucus called mucines. Turns out mucines are very interesting. So uh, most of your microbiome in your gut resides within the mucus of your, of your stomach wall. Uh, but it also turns out, for instance, uh, many cancer patients taking uh, chemotherapeutic agents, one of the biggest problems they have is dry right. throat because it kills all of the mucines. And very, very little is known. More is being learned now because people are starting to study the microbiome. But uh, her name is Katerina Rebeck. She's a, a young professor, just moved from uh, where she did all her work in, in German institutions to MIT, um, but unbelievably passionate. Um, in mucus, right? So I'm not sure, she's probably not really good at small talk, but she's unbelievably passionate. So we were working, so we are now synthesizing these mucins. So the idea is to make derivatives of these things that you can use, because you can't, you, you know how you get mucus that they use now, you basically set up by a hog farm in Arkansas, and you scrape the gut walls of, of hogs, and okay. then you purify it. Not, not difficult business model, but so if we want to make them synthetically, so early on, we started to work with a Swiss-based firm, Cordon Pharma. And we were setting up there, and we knew a gentleman from a previous venture we had done that was working there. He's a great, great carbohydrate chemist. We wanted to work with him and with Cordon. Cordon in Switzerland was a little, you know, what's the size of this business? Do we really want to set up something in, in Massachusetts to do this or anything like that? So it turns out that Katerina Rebeck, early in her career, wrote a book, uh, a children's book, on mucus. <laughs> <laughs> and, and all the great things about snot, which apparently is very popular in Germany. And literally, the executive team of Corden learning this, they're like, oh, my children have read this book. You are Katerina Rebeck. And boom, right together, all of a sudden you had all sorts of dinner conversations, relationships that develop that became a very good foundational stone to building this company. Corden Pharma has turned out to be a spectacular partner because it's not built on money. It's built on, they understand the vision of where this is going, they understand the people, they spent the time doing all of that, and now they're providing resources we never imagined. We thought we were gonna have one carbohydrate chemist, we have six chemists, they set up shop internationally, twice a year we go over there, spend a month, manufacturing to figure out how to do it scale over there. So again, th those relationships and how they develop, maybe it wasn't small talk, but uh, being very passionate about what you do is also a, a great way to do it. So yeah, you, th those encounters you, you have and, and, and the, the chances you, you get, um, that's, that's a big part of, of being successful. But um, the other part would be to be systematic in some way, managing um, the transition from being a local uh, leader to a global player. How would you yeah, describe the process? What, what is the, the nitty gritty of, of kind of scaling it up? Um, John, would you 
I mean, after your total immersion in Korea, um, <laughs> that, that you can't do that too often, can you? <laughs> well, well it is, it's, it's the care and feeding then of, um, of the relationship, because as, as Doug says, it's way beyond money then. It's, it's absolutely, um, you know, it's resources beyond you, what your dreams are. And as, and as the original relationship takes bloom, I'm now five years into that relationship, but new needs come up and new markets come up. So new opportunities you're able to capture if you nurture those relationships the right way and continue to travel and push yourself into new opportunities. Um, you know, the, the, the world is, is truly flat. Freeman was right. And it's, um, you know, this is the greatest time in terms of the smallness of the of world and the ability to still be local. So for instance, we have to recycle these materials from a logistics point of view um, and just from uh, all sorts of other reasons domestically. But being international, so many of our clients are international in terms of when you think of Samsung, when you think of Panasonic, but then also our downstreams are international. Plus also e-waste is the fastest growing waste stream not only here in New York City, mm. but as you know, the movie's already been done in Germany and Europe. They have already eight to 10 years ahead of us when it comes to electronic waste recycling, but it's the fastest growing solid waste stream in the entire world. So being, having knowledge about what the trends are in countries that were five to eight years ahead of us, such as Germany. We studied Germany before we got in this business and while we were scaling it. We studied Japan. Mm -hmm. You have to actually be an expert on what's going on internationally if you want to master it locally. Mm -hmm. So Doug, what, what would you say, how do you, I mean, you said that your companies are moving um, into, into international um, areas because the manufacturing is being done there. What, what do you do to m make or prepare um, the companies for that step? Do you manage that outright? Do you look for certain people to, bring, to be brought in? Or how do you manage that? So uh, again, there's there's lots of different ways. It's so hard to generalize. There's lots of different ways different companies do it differently. I think our experience has been again we're, we tend to be working with uh, very early stage technology. So, so there's a real there's a real chance uh, greater than chance that there's going to be failure because you're still understanding your technical process while you're trying to move it overseas while you're trying to meet the strict deadlines of manufacturing for a product and so I think again you're always doing two things you're building you're building the relationship so that when things don't go correctly or and it's, it's both ways right all of a sudden there's something in their manufacturing process and all your relationships thought you never found out mm -hmm. and it's three levels down but it's like no this is how we do it right so it's it's both sides there's going to be surprises so you're always managing the relationship to do that but I think the biggest thing is you, you have to deliver um, and you really have to deliver once you go internationally. So again, for HZO, I, I remember the first project we were doing uh, that we got pulled into was um, the Nike fuel van. So it was a wearable device, they wanted it waterproof, and, and they decided to go that direction. And for us, this is before Nike has since pulled that product, they're moving out of that market. But this was our first big manufacturing plant, and it was early. I mean, we weren't ready. So we literally ran a facility in the U.S., a devoted machine, trying to do everything that we were going to have to do overseas and doing it 2x, because we realized, look, if we can't deliver, we can't deliver a million coded products, and there's zero failures, we're never going to get a second one. Mm -hmm. So we were literally running in Utah, right? We were running exact same process of manufacturing, anything like that. We were doing this in China with Flextronic, so of course you're going to use an OEM, so it was Nike, Flextronics and, and us there. And clearly, HZO, I mean, Flextronics is a large you know, company. <laughs> Nike is very large and powerful. And then there's a little Utah-based <laughs> HZO. Um, so we just had to be perfect um, across the board. When there was a problem, we figured we better set solving it. So we had teams running literally 24 hours around the clock because of the time difference, trying to solve every problem in Utah while we simultaneously solved it um, over there. And the other thing we do is we tend to then very quickly, so we spent the money to hire international teams. So instead of sending, you know, even though they were, they could speak the foreign language, they understand it, they had lived in the country, we hired very quickly 
um, a, a, a literally a Chinese team in that case. In other cases, we've hired other teams so that they're moving at the same speed, understanding everything that's happening. And the whole goal, so we spend extra. But in the Nike case, we develop, I think we ultimately manufactured about uh, two to three million devices without a return. Literally the first thing we'd ever manufactured at a scale outside. And that, that worked well because now we do Microsoft tablets. Mm -hmm. So the Microsoft tablet mm -hmm. is now being manufactured. So kind of just waterproof. You saw that the NFL right. picture in the New York Times the other day. That was HCO's coding mm -hmm. um, that allows them to literally, you can pour Gatorade on it. You can spill your coffee on the device. Oh, and, finally. Uh, that's the journalist. Still, that's so it good. It still works. But I mean, so I you have, to, have to execute. And for a small tech company, you have to do it perfectly. When, when they don't, we often don't get a second or third chance. The relationship sometimes buys us a second chance, mm -hmm. um, but I mean, you have to deliver. You have to have both ends covered, right? Yeah. Uh, it's the personal approach and uh, and um, the face time. But then once you make that first step, you really have to deliver, yeah. and you have to be there. And there's so and much. There's so you, much depth by the large companies that you're going to deliver. Right? They're so used to. American firms coming over making this promise and then hit, hit, not delivering. Hit, hit, hit and run. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you, you have to do it. You have to deliver now. But if you do, it develops. I mean, that relationship moves five or six scales above that very rapidly. And I mean, that's, that's the way you have to do it if you're going to be successful. You mentioned that you, you hire um, local teams. Being a global player, you hire local teams. Um, I, I think it's a matter of trust in the sense that. Um, it might make it easier if you hire a local team and they have, they not only share the same language, they, they share the same expectations, mentality, how things work. You would never really, you know, in some instances, it, it, there's just a time around midday when uh, in, I grew up in Spain, you just don't call because, I mean, there is an expectation of um, being left alone to have lunch. Um, so if you would call at that hour, even if they would pick up the phone, um, I think it was a little dent in the relationship after that. So um, what do you think? It's, um, that's still like it used to be 10, 20 years ago. It, it didn't really change the trust factor, that you tend to trust more people you feel share a common cultural, regional, local, um, set of values, or I think, it, I think it's also having somebody to advocate. You know, because the biggest problem with companies is you know drinking your own wine, you know, believing that the people at headquarters are smarter than everybody else, and having somebody else out there in the field saying, "Hey, don't forget about us. This is the way it should be done." You know, means you've got to feed and be responsive to that person. And so I think also a lot of times the way people look at international investments is, you know. You don't look at it for a return on the same scale as you look at a domestic return on investment because it's just it's just going to take longer. It's going to cost more. You've got to be more devoted. You're going to make you're going to have more problems because it's long distance. So you've got to work twice as hard for the same revenue. But at the end of the day, you know the rule of marketing still exists that it's always easier to sell to your existing customers than to get new customers, right? So that's that's sort of at the heart of it. Mm -hmm. So you think that that um, that didn't really change and I mean all this talk about being global and living in a, in a global world at the end of the day it, it's still who you know and how you build your relationships and how you tend to them um, and it doesn't really matter if it's if it's so if it kind of on a global or local scale it's it's always building building that local connection in the sense of being face to face, being the person to talk to, not just the email, the other end of the email um, thread, or um, you know, did you copy paste um, so and so on that? Um, so, how would you advise companies that I mean, you bringing up companies uh, from scratch, as you said? I mean, when you look at, at companies, smaller companies, for them, it's a big step. And um, you, John, you said it rightfully that it is scratch um, for for a lot of people to kind of really um, get up and, and, and go global. How would you approach that and, and make the assessment that it has to be done and how would you then tell them how to, how to do it? How to really, kind of, which step would be in your view the, the most important one and the first one? 
Do you have a? You may have. Well, it goes. It goes back to what John was saying earlier. The problem is, it, it goes to the DNA of the of the leadership of the of the company. If the DNA of the leadership of the company is not open to it, is these you know, there's a large segment still of a, of U.S. business people that unfortunately still have that almost borders mentality and imperialistic mentality. And I have competitors that said, I don't know how you spend 30 days in Korea. I wouldn't go there for two days. And so, I mean, and then you wonder, and then a year later they're gone or they're, you know, whatever happens. So the idea is, yeah, it, it goes to the, 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 the leadership and the, uh, the, the values of the entrepreneur that Doug's backing or uh, John's involved with and, and collaborating with. Um, for our company, they, we knew from the beginning this was how it was going to go. As we started growing it, we there was no there was no ifs ands or buts. Um, you know, when you meet with leadership from uh, Panasonic or 80 OEMs here in New York City, because their offices are in New Jersey, or Samsung or LG, whose offices are in New Jersey, they respect you five times more because of your travel and your knowledge of their culture there, from whether it's food, drink, people geography uh, and it, it the history the history history and it can, it's that's an even better point and it continues to um, fertilize and give sunshine and water to that relationship and it grows in directions you never could have expected because as Doug points out every business relationship and collaboration and partnership has absolute potholes and hitches along the way so the more you do to bridge culturally your company, this country, with their country, and find common ground before the hitch in the pothole comes up, the more you're setting your company up for success. Yeah, so I, I'd say that it's two things. It's, it's uh, who, you know, every business, particularly small businesses, are trying to figure out who can you become important to, right? And that's really what you were yeah. doing with Raising Capital, mm -hmm. right, is you were saying, who can I become important to? Mm -hmm. And um, to the extent that you have you know, like the biggest insult you can give somebody is to say they have no background, right? So if you have a background that understands their background and you that allows you to be, become important to that company, and there's just more companies internationally that you can be important to than domestically, particularly in business like electronics and things like that, that that's really what it's all about. To, it's about, you know, what is your problem set, right? What is the, the solution set? You have a solution set, what's the problem set? It's much bigger internationally. Um, and, and, it, and I think that's part of it. I, I think a lot of, so, so I'll come back tactically. I mean, to me it's very simple from a leadership position I found, which are, you know, you know I, I like to spend my time, and I think most people, especially people who have been successful, like to spend their time with inquisitive people. Right, so the, and, and that inquisitive nature, I want to understand about your culture. I want to understand why you do this. How did you get into business? So let me understand the history. If all that comes from an inquisitive nature, and I think that that's just critical across all areas of leadership. I want to understand, so wait, you're saying my product doesn't work for you. Why is that, right? I want to get to understand that um, at all levels. I think that that's, that's a big um, concept that if you're going to succeed internationally, I, I would assume if you're going to succeed in any leadership position, you have to be inquisitive, right? You're, you're well read. You, you think of, of uh, cultures, you think of history, you think of all those things. Tactically, I may mean, I'll just sort of approach this question tactically as I think about it. I mean, to me, it's it's um, if you're going to build a relationship, the more things you do together, the more point faster, right? So again, when I was talking about this company and, and manufacturing, I mean, you did a couple things. One, you're running things in 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 this case Utah, but it's been in other places the same way you're running there. Those people are talking, right? So oh, we found this. Oh, we found this. And of course, we're still learning because it's a very early technology. So now you're passing ideas. The other thing was is it wasn't just we hired locally. We hired locally and then sent a whole team over there. So we probably had, you know, 1.8x the amount of people doing this in the first days that we needed. Some of them were from our company. Some of them were local. That intersection right there. Oh, we met these people from Utah. Now you have a relationship across those firms that are really important. You're learning things. You're learning things culturally, everything like that. So to me, it's sort of, you know, you have to deliver. You have to move teams there. You have to have not just 
hiring people on the ground there to understand, but bringing in your own people to build those relationships. And then senior management was going back and forth and back and forth and asking that. You know, at the board level, we were talking to the American, you know, the German COO that runs the company but based in Utah, travels across the world. But we were also bringing in a gentleman, Randy Chang, from Shenzhen. Mm -hmm. right, that was running the operations there and spending time and talking to both of him. Tremendous amount of learning that then builds, but from a people perspective, you know, you just had so many relationships intersecting. So very quickly, you know, there was a, a tighter relationship. It's sort of like, you know, you, you go on, this would be another Utah thing, right? You marry really young, you go on 30 dates with somebody, right? You go to dinner 30 times, right? That's a lot different than trekking through Nepal with somebody for six months, right? Living in Korea for 30 days in, in a series of meetings. You really get to know that person. You decide, is this a person I'm going to spend a lot of time with, build a company with, work through all the technical difficulties with? So there's a lot of tactical things you can do that ultimately impact the relationship. But it all comes back to me. If you're not inquisitive, people you send over there have you know, one interest, get it and get back. You know, you're going you're to end up you might end up with a decent product for a little bit, but you're not going to end up with, you know, with the a real relationship. So, um, well, that was very interesting coming from very different areas, very diff different sectors of the economy. But what it boils down to is invest in your printed business cards, um, have a lot of air miles, and um, be prepared to spend a couple of days somewhere. Um, and maybe invite some other people in and have a barbecue or hot dogs or whatever you might consider the American way. And um, I want to open this um, discussion for the audience. Um, and um, yeah, so if you have any any other questions um, regarding going going global, I have a question regarding the challenge of uh, the uh, uh, commons. Doug, to your point, uh, uh, commons becoming global rather than local, what does that do to the risk profile of your business now that such, a, um, such an important part of it is in a different place? And do you factor that into, uh, uh, into your business plans? And it's not just that it's far from you, it's also very concentrated. So you have the commons something bad happens, it happens to all of it, not just to part of it. How do you think about that? Uh, yes, yeah, so number one answer is it ramps up the risk dramatically. So two entrepreneurs in the room expect lower valuations in your early stage companies um, would, be, would be two statements to that. Yeah, I mean, we, we've seen it, we've done a couple things. So, so the first thing, um, after spending a lot of years um, as, as sort of, without controlling the end process, and being a subcomponent, or we joke sometimes that we're a subcomponent of a subcomponent. Um, the first thing I would always say to any entrepreneur in the room is move up the value chain, right? So don't make a part for GoPro, make the GoPro camera, right? You, you control so much more of what's happening in your business if you do that. For us, um, I mean, the, the risks, I mean, you've seen in the semiconductor electronics, I mean, you know, name. Uh, a premier U.S. venture capital firm that does anything in the semiconductors and electronics space anymore in America. You can't do it. You can't finance it. You can't make money. And they, and then, and then once you actually make something successful, we're an LED company, right? It's fantastic. It's you know, its revenue went from zero, right, to over a hundred million dollars in revenue. We'll lose our investment in that in that deal, right? We'll, we won't even break even in that deal because it's gotten commoditized so quickly. So I, I think that. Um, the you have to be where the commons is. So, so who's doing electronic semiconductors? They've all moved over to Asia. Whereas we used to be able to move those parts together. Um, I don't think we know we have a solution to it. I would just say it really ramps up the risk, and you have to be prepared for that. And you try to figure out very very early can you actually get traction? And so, if you can, it might be worth it. So I'll give the other side of that is that according to where you get off the the journey is really important. Right. If you recognize you're a small company, and so what we did, at, we had a company called Cologix. It was technology that was developed in Germany to remediate uh, catalysts that's used in coal-fired power plants. And we used the fact that there were state rules that were becoming federal rules. We grew our business to like $20 million in sales, and then we got the break of breaks, and that was that China had put into their five-year plan that all coal-fired power plants were going to have to put our catalyst in or shut down. Right, our type of catalyst, right? And 
And so this is going to be like a $600 million a year opportunity. We went over to China. We met the Chinese Minister of Environmental Protection. We came to the conclusion there's no way we're going to be able to build enough plants in China and we'll be able to protect our technology. We're not going to be able to play, right? So we immediately hired uh, UBS. They did, ran a process. We sold the company for $100 million, 101, five times revenue, because there was somebody out there in the world that wanted to take that risk. And so just recognize where you are in the food chain and just be humble enough to realize you probably can't do everything. Sure. So at least two of you represent public companies, and you've talked about persistence, and you've talked about investment in, uh, in operating abroad. Uh, at what point do you say enough is enough? I have a duty to my shareholder. Uh, uh, some of you have said it's not about the money, but your shareholders might disagree with that. And uh, it's, so, what do you? So, when do you say enough is enough? I'm out of here. I'm going to cut my losses, and uh, I can't compete with a, a, a mid-market, privately owned German company because they have a completely different investment horizon than my shareholders do. I mean, I'm not sure I'll answer your question. I mean, we, we spent a lot of time thinking about this, right? So, there's not that many publicly traded venture capital firms. Um, clearly, we invest over a five to ten year time horizon, and the assumption is that your shareholders um, demand a return in, in a far shorter period of time. I mean, I think my response to that is, so, so prepare for that, right? So you have to have enough capital to get through the downs in the cycle that may come, but ultimately, it's do you provide a compound annual growth rate that is competitive that's going to make people want to invest in you? And the problem with our business is that may happen. Um, it may go dry for three, four, five years, and then the big return may come, right? And uh, we're, we're in a quantum computing company called D-Wave in, uh, in British Columbia. I mean, I, I don't know. I mean, either that company's going to be worth nothing in a couple of years, or quantum computing is coming. Right? And it's going to change the face of how you think of computing. And that company could easily be a $10 billion company. And Harris and Harris Group overnight could be worth $200, $300 million more than we are today. And we're only a $100 million market cap company. Right? So you know, some short-term shareholder will get that nice little swing. But from my perspective, if you have the money to operate and execute through that, you just have to deal with the market for what it's worth. But I have shareholders that have held Harris and Harris Group for 20 years, and I have shareholders that have held Harris and Harris Group for three days, right? And you know, the point is, at the end of the day, I have to, over some given period of time, generate that type of return. So I, I tend to say, um, you know, you gotta always be concerned about shareholder return and shareholder value. But I, I can't govern all the different time frames that everybody's buying into and out of my stock. It's much easier in, a, in an LP partnership because they bought in 10 years ago and they want exit 10 years later. For me, I have shareholders coming in and out all the time. But I, I think as a manager, you have to just manage through that period of time. So we don't throw in the towel. We love the permanent capital because guess what? When that two or 300 comes in, I don't have to return it. I can reinvest it and hope for the next two or 300 million. And that's what's allowed us to survive for 30 years. Yeah, it's just ironic that the first venture capital company you know, uh, George Dorio's uh, uh, AR, American Research and Development was a public company, right? And the same thing weighs, I think, on Dan and on my company, Acorn, that, that killed ARD, right? That was ultimately bought by Textron. They created DEC computers and Ionics and a bunch of other companies. But is the regulatory burden, right? I mean, it just our country is destroying the interests of being a publicly traded company because they're making it so expensive, and uh, so it's it's brutal. I mean, you know, they, they, this, the most recent outrage is that Barney Frank passed this thing that says that you know we have to like, man, you know, tell people like whether we're using conflict minerals, right? I mean, <coughs> when did when did the SEC become like part of the Bureau of Mines? I mean, it's just it's just bizarre, right? And well, <laughs> I think we're getting into a whole other discussion yes. here, and uh, and it's a very valid point. Um, that Americans um, and American public companies have a different um, outlook um, than uh, mid-sized German uh, family-owned businesses. Um, 
and that um, that influences their strategy and um, how they operate. But unfortunately, we're running out of time.